What I'd like to do is to share with you some thoughts about how to disciple uh, a community of people who've left Islam and some of the challenges involved in that and uh, some of the strategies that we've found to be successful. I'm, I'm drawing heavily on two things. One is the research I've done on Islam and some of the perspectives that I shared last night, but also um, the experience of leading the Iranian congregation, Emmanuel uh, Iranian Church in Melbourne over the last five or so years. Um, this church arose in quite an interesting way. There was, um, and I'm not saying all Muslim background churches are the same by any means, but um, there was a flood of uh, refugees coming into Australia by boats from Indonesia. People would buy a ticket to Indonesia, which is very easy for Iranians to do, and then pay a people smuggler to put them on a boat and they'd be picked up by the Australian Navy, they'd make an asylum claim, and so they'd end up in Australia. We had tens of thousands in a short period of time until the government stopped the flow. And quite a number of them began to become Christians. Um, there was in particular a, a woman who's, um, an Iranian woman who was quite a gifted evangelist, and she was gathering a, a group of Iranians, and they were meeting, she was holding revival meetings in another part of the city. And they'd had trouble finding anyone who would look after them. So they approached a number of churches and said, look, we, we're meeting each week, will you pastor us? And as it, it turned out, they ended up coming to me and asking if I'd be their pastor. We had a welcome lunch for our normal English speaking church, expecting about 30 people and 70 people turned up on the day, including 40 Iranians. So off we went. So since 2013, the start of 2013, I've been working with this group and I spend um, a good bit of Tuesday and Saturday with them each week, um, uh, meeting with their leaders and, and working with them. And it's been a really fascinating task to uh, help establish a healthy Christian community from a group of people who are totally from a non-Christian background. So almost every member of the church was not a practicing Christian five years ago, and almost all of them have left uh, Islam. There's a few, a few exceptions perhaps, um, and there are a few that have been Christians from time in Iran for a longer period of time, but mostly they're all new Christians and they're all new to Christianity. And, and having a church of 100 or so regular members, I think there's 120 really that count Emmanuel as their church, having a, a church which is almost totally composed of new Christians brings lots of challenges. And I, I often think about Paul's task of going to a place, planting a church, being there for a year or maybe three months or maybe two years, raising up leaders and say, right, off you go, I've established you, do it. You know, I'll write letters to you from time to time. And uh, so that's been, in a way, the task that we've been in, involved in. Um, many people who work with Muslim background believers find it quite difficult. Uh, and I mean, I found it difficult, but it is challenging. People often have a high level of brokenness. So um, working with the Iranians, they have very high levels of domestic violence in their family backgrounds, often incest. Um, many of them have been uh, tormented by the state. Perhaps they've been tortured. Um, they've experienced abuse, living in fear, uh, lots of emotional problems, lots of brokenness. And uh, having a whole congregation made up of broken people is, uh, is quite a challenge. How do you find leaders? How do you identify uh, good people to disciple for leadership? And how can you build healing into the church? Um, what often happens is that those communities that arise in this way break up or they're unable to sustain their community. Well, they end up in pockets. So you'll, if, you, if you look at cities in the West which have Iranian converts in them, if they have a few Iranian churches in one city, one church will, will be critical of the other. Oh, don't go to that church, go to our church, you know. And there's quite a level of competitiveness. Often people want to lead, so they'll get upset if they're not appointed as leaders. They'll often break away, form a competing group. You have rivalries between groups, a lot of jealousy, and um, it's just difficult. It's difficult for them. Um, problems with family environments, family backgrounds too. So I was really thrust into this, this, this melting pot of people, hungry people, passionate people. Um, Lots of wonderful things about this community as well. I, I've always believed in miracles all my life and we've seen many of them, but I've never seen quite as many as we've had amongst the, this Iranian community. And that's been a great joy. So you see the power of God at work 
and that keeps you going. It gives you uh, some confidence that God is on the case, but at the same time, there's extraordinary difficulties, difficulties too, uh, as, as well. I mean, just an example of, um, uh, of, a, of an experience of the grace of God in that way. We had a, a couple who approached us. They said they wanted to be baptized and become Christians. Later, they told us they were just doing it for visa purposes. So they, were, they wanted to say they were Christians so that they'd get asylum. <laughs> But they found the experience of coming to church and being discipled more compelling than they'd expected. And they developed a very deep and passionate faith and wonderful family, actually. I baptized them. Uh, by that time, I devolved all the evangelism and basic discipleship to the Iranian teams. So they were discipled by, by others and we baptized them. And then a few months after they'd been baptized, I was preaching one day on There is Power in the Name of Jesus. That's the, the song we sang earlier. This morning, very moving. And um, after that, after that song, um, the, the mother of the family, she was quite troubled for her mother, who's back in Iran. And so she she went by herself after the service to the cross, which was at the front of the church, and she prayed for her mother, who has breast cancer. And um, that night, her mother went to sleep, uh, to bed in pain. She had quite a large tumor, which hadn't been picked up early enough to operate, and. Uh, the, the tumor caused her serious pain. She could only sleep on, in certain positions and even then she was in pain. So she went to bed in pain that night. But she woke up the next day, which was a Sunday morning, without any pain at all. And she went to the, the doctors on Monday morning and had a complete body scan. And they couldn't find any cancers in her body. And um, this the previous week she had a scan and there was a huge tumor there. And. Uh, this woman who'd prayed, she came and she told me the story and she said, you know, Mark, um, Pastor Mark, she said, um, the problem is, I think, she said, that people don't believe. <laughs> they don't believe there's power in the name of Jesus. And uh, so that's uh, just an example. And uh, this, uh, every time I pray for people, I think, well, what is God going to do next? Well, I know it's not me. I know it's not some great capacity I have. I do believe, I believe God can do anything and I pray in faith, but there's been a, um, just an outpouring of grace in people's lives. Remarkable really, absolutely remarkable. I sometimes think um, revival is a bit like surfing. You know, when the great wave comes along, you better be on it <laughs> uh, because that's what you've been ready for. And uh, so it's been exciting to be catching some of those waves. I've also met people who've worked amongst people, uh, converts, and found it very difficult. Uh, in January, I was at a meeting and there was a German woman uh, sharing how she was leading uh, Iranians to the Lord, but every time she had a group, they would break up. They would have conflicts, they'd have fight with each other, there'd be jealousy, and she just found it, it was so heartbreaking to try and sustain a community because people themselves were very broken, and if you put a hundred broken people or even five broken people together in a church and they're not healed, then the church has troubles. So some of the issues that are typical, um, uh, just arising out of the material I was presenting last night, uh, jealousy. Um, if you appoint one person as the leader, someone else will say, why wasn't I appointed? And they'll be quite aggressive about it sometimes as well. There'll be a lot of gossip, very high level of gossip. People will smile to your face, but when they're away, they'll say the most appalling things. Um, there's a verse in the Quran that says that um, Muslims should not be friends with non-Muslims. Uh, except uh, to guard uh, themselves. So the idea is that if the Muslims are vulnerable, they're allowed to be friends with non-Muslims. And one commentator said, you know, we smile in their faces, but our hearts are comforted by cursing them, by hate. Our hearts are comforted by hate. Now, that's just to do with relationships between Muslims and non-Muslims, but that, that culture of deceit, which Muhammad encouraged, um, uh, that's a whole topic in itself, can create a, a culture of, of actually deception, of, of people not being direct. They'll give you one, your, their face to you will be one thing, but with somebody else they'll say something else. And this is, this is very damaging for, for a church, very damaging for community, because you get all these breaks uh, between people, breakdowns of relationship. There can be competitiveness, wanting to be superior. Remember, Islam says, come to success, come to success. And, once people kind of latch onto Christianity, then they want to be the best in, in that, and that can really damage the church. You, 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 they, they don't understand the, the Lord Jesus who washed people's feet. Uh, they, people can easily take offense uh, and uh, leave because you've offended them. Um, 
There can also be careless and destructive words, a lot of cursing, a lot of word curses. So parents will, if their child is being naughty, they'll say, you're Satan, what are you doing? And so, you know, you have to teach parents that in Jesus Christ, it's not a good thing to call your children Satan. It's not ideal. It's not good for them, it's not good for you, you know. Um, so th this, this can be a real issue sometimes. Um, so careless and destructive words. So when people enter the Christian faith, a really important issue is to make that entry point, to do it well. Um, and what I'm going to do is go over, um, in, in the Liberty to the Captives book that you've been given, there is a, a, a prayer of commitment. Our experiences in discipling people coming out of the occult and witchcraft, Satanism and everything, caused my wife and I to think deeply about the prayer of commitment. So this is the, I want to be a Christian prayer. Um, just to give you an example of a simple prayer of commitment that's widely used, the Alpha prayer. Um, sorry, please, thank you. Sorry that I've sinned. Uh, please forgive me. Please give me, uh, thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. There you go. Done, deal, you're a Christian. <laughs> um, the problem with a lot of the, 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 the simple uh, prayers of commitment is they're not comprehensive enough and they miss certain aspects that are very important. So for example, that prayer, the Alpha prayer, I've used Alpha many times, I love the Alpha course, but that particular prayer that's used in the Alpha course, it doesn't involve the person coming to Christ to submit to Christ as their Lord. It's not written into the prayer. So if, if, you, if that's your discipleship, if you disciple someone to know forgiveness of sins and maybe the gift of the Spirit, they want, but they don't know that they should submit to Christ as Lord, what will happen? Well, they'll, they'll be in rebellion in different areas of their life. And they also won't count the cost of following Christ properly. They'll think, this is a great thing to add to my life. But the fundamental issue of surrendering all to follow Jesus has not been properly explained to them. It's sort of tucked away somewhere there in the course, not to cause people to be too distressed, perhaps. Um, and we found that in leading people to Christ, actually it's good to slow them down, not to be too quick to pray the prayer with them, but to count the cost, to work through what it means to be submitted properly to Christ as Lord. Um, another issue which is a, a, a disadvantage in some of the prayers of commitment that are used is that there isn't a, a proper breaking with the past. There is a, isn't a proper turning away. Um, to, to follow Christ involves a transfer of your allegiance. Uh, and that transfer needs to be really understood and owned by the person. Um, before, uh, before baptism, I generally give um, the new believers a talk in which I explain being a Christian is like playing football, that is soccer, you know. And that is that you need to be sure which team you belong to. It's not very helpful to be kicking the ball in the wrong direction in the middle of a soccer game. You know, you, you could get into a lot of trouble if you're scoring goals for the other team all the time. So, and if you're a professional soccer player and you want to change teams, it's not enough to just sign up with a new team. You have to leave the old team. You have to make a break and then join the new side. And, and please don't be going in both directions at once. You know, that's you will be a mess. People will destroy you if you do that in the middle of a serious game. And, and, and so it's just to, to encourage people to realize that they need to turn away from their old way of life. Um, an important issue is occult involvements and commitments. Have people been doing witchcraft, fortune telling, all those sorts of things. You know, as part of discipling someone um, to Christ in any context, you need to check that and make sure they've renounced those practices. And if you don't, then they can, you can end up with a total mess in someone's life. They can be really afflicted and not in, not in a very helpful way. So stepping through that. And is, Islam is really open to the occult because I think, partly because Muhammad had these jinn that became Muslims by listening to the Quran. So in the Islamic understanding, there are some Muslim demons, you know, and this creates an open doorway for the occult. So almost all Muslim societies have very serious occult issues of one kind or another. And so early on in the discipleship process or regularly through it, we teach about witchcraft, renouncing witchcraft, depending only on the power of God. Uh, that's important as well. Um, so in order to address this, in the Liberty to the Captives book on page 107, there's a prayer of commitment. 
Uh, and it's, it's not just a three-point prayer. It's, it's a 20-point prayer. And I'll just step through some of the, the points in that prayer to, to help you know, get a handle on what does it mean to turn to Christ. So there's the declaration of faith in God and a renouncing of all other so-called gods. Um, there's an acknowledgement of sin against God and against others and naming that as disobedience and rebellion. Um, there's an acknowledgement that you can't save yourself as well. And then there's a declaration of faith in Christ as the as, as Son of God who died on the cross and raised from the dead. Um, he's taken judgment. And also we're turning away from sins, a request for forgiveness, and, a, and a, an acceptance, a reception of that forgiveness as well. And because um, this is such an important issue coming out of Islam, an acceptance of God as Father as well. And asking for the gift of eternal life. This is next one is very important. I hand over the rights of my life to Christ and invite him to rule as Lord of my life from this day onwards. That's often a step that's missed in discipleship. People want to follow Jesus, but they want to basically hold on to the title to their life. And they need to really give that to the Lord, and that needs to be explained to them. That's what he asked for. You need to die to yourself and follow me, take up the cross. You need to renounce all other spiritual allegiances, including occult allegiances, um, and renounce the Shahada and all its claims. And we have a prayer for that. We did that last night. And sometimes there's specific things that, that people need to do. There was a couple who became Christians, and he was a truck driver. And in Iran, um, in order to keep him safe, she'd gotten someone to do a ring for him which had magic attached to it, and this would protect him. Maybe it would stop him being ensnared by other women. I'm not sure what the full purpose of the ring was, but it was definitely an occult thing, and he was still wearing this ring. And they came to me and they said, look, we, we, after you've been speaking about these things, we realize I can't wear this ring anymore, and will you help me deal with it? You know? And I said, sure, I'd love to do that. So, they gave me the ring and we just broke any curses and um, they renounced any commitments involved in buying that and wearing that and I took it home and smashed it up and, uh, as they asked me to and we got rid of that. So that's an example of the actually handing over the rights of your life to Christ so that you're not, as it were, trying to manipulate things using occult power on the side. Renouncing other spiritual allegiances as well. Also rejecting Satan and all evil and making all agreements that you've made with demons. People make agreements with demons in all sorts of subtle ways. Um, and that's quite a comprehensive topic in itself. Maybe people have partnered with violence or they've exploited power in an ungodly way. There's lots of ways people without even realizing can enter into ungodly covenants. Um, there's a rejection of ungodly covenants of the ancestors. It's a very biblical idea that you renounce the agreements that the ancestors have made on your behalf. And this is important in Islam because the Shahada, the Islamic uh, covenant, is an intergenerational covenant that passes on from parents to children. Also, this is quite important, renounce all psychic or spiritual abilities that don't come from God. We had a woman in our church who was making quite a bit of money out of reading people's fortunes. So people, she charged people two or three hundred dollars to read their tea leaves or whatever. And she had a quite a strong psychic gift, like she would see spirits, she could discern the future, she was really gifted in that way. So she'd been making money out of it, it was a big part of her life, and that's like a channel was open in her life. So when she came to Christ, I led her through a prayer just renouncing those gifts, putting them aside, finished, gone, don't want it anymore. And also asking the Lord, please bless me with whatever gifts you want me to have, but I only want the gifts that God wants me to have. I'm not going to kind of be dragged into the kingdom of God with these kind of witchcraft gifts hanging on because they're so useful to me. That's not helpful. So that's really important. And if you've got 100 people from an Islamic background, there'll be a dozen people or 20 people who may have different psychic gifts of different kinds that they've been practicing, and they need to leave that at the door. That's part of the the filthy rags, you know, that has to be set aside. If you don't do that, you'll have a congregation with people who are practicing witchcraft while they're worshiping, and you won't know about it. It'll be, still be there. They'll be, they'll be functioning in that mode. It could happen anyway. It's quite likely. Um, asking for the gift of the Holy Spirit uh, and, a, and a commitment to be changed and transformed, a release of the fruit of the Spirit in someone's life, 
And also consecration, that's quite important. Consecrate yourself to the living God. I, be, I declare before human witnesses and before all spiritual authorities that I consecrate and bind myself to God through Jesus Christ. And a declaration of identity. I declare that I'm a citizen of heaven. God is my protector with the help of the Holy Spirit. I choose to submit to and follow Jesus Christ and him alone as Lord of all my days. So as part of preparing someone for baptism, you go through a comprehensive prayer of commitment and explain the significance of all those elements. So when people are baptized, they're really ready. And it's not that you, you, you're explaining to people later. You know, you don't want the Christian life to be bait and switch. You know, bait and switch is you say, come to Jesus and he'll make you happy. And then they come in and say, oh, you have to die to yourself. Well, no one told me about that. It's better to explain it all first. So people know, and then they, they, they actually enter into relationship with Christ from a position of wholehearted devotion, especially if God has saved them and they know the power of God and they're actually ready to trust the Lord Jesus with everything, but you don't ask them to do that, uh, then you're really selling them short and you're going to create lots of problems in their lives. Very hard to disciple a church which is full of people who haven't entered well, who didn't make a proper break and have not had this call to consecrate themselves, for example. So that's an important process. And we've paid quite a lot of care uh, to that d the believer's prayer, to teaching it, making sure people take, go through it. Part of it is the prayer renouncing Islam as well, and, and then praying with people, breaking curses off them, um, setting them free from the past, dealing with any issues that come up in that process. Now, when a community or a group of people turn to Christ, they bring their culture with them. You know, they don't just become cultureless. And some of that culture is good, maybe hospitality, grace, kindness, there can be really good things in their culture that are not part of Western culture, uh, really admirable things. Um, but some of the culture is not good because over centuries, um, you know, Satan has a go at culture. He tries to corrupt it. He destroys it. He, he twists it. He uses it for his own purposes. And when Islam has been working away at a culture over a thousand years, it has a deep impact on the culture. And so when people come to Christ as a community, they need to rebuild their culture and change their culture. And that needs guidance. So they need help with that. And you need to teach them how to have a new culture. And there's that period when they've first come to Christ and they've seen these miracles, like my friend whose mother was healed, and they have a very high willingness to engage in that process, and they need strong discipleship at that time. Um, uh, for example, family culture. Um, Iranian families, not all of them, but many of them have problems with boundaries regarding their children. So the children will stay up very late at night. Um, they're not disciplined very well. They just run wild in the church. Doing a children's program is very difficult with these children. Uh, I think at some point, as they get into adulthood, they're supposed to settle down. But particularly the boys uh, are very difficult to manage. This causes lots of problems for the families. It means the children can't engage well in the children's program at church. They're often exhausted when they get to school because the parents have been up until late at night, and the children have as well. And you have this kind of chaos happening in the family uh, because there aren't clear boundaries, and the children are treated as if they have power to run the family life and to drive it along. And, um, and, and these, are, these are quite hard issues. So teaching people to have healthy boundaries. What does it mean to, to uh, tell a child a bedtime story, to establish a bedtime routine? Uh, why do children need safe boundaries? These might seem like just obvious things if you've grown up in that culture that, that's part of your life. But if people are coming out of a very different family culture, it's very disruptive and difficult for them and they need help. So one of the things we're working on at the moment is a parenting course which communicates Christian values and helps people to transform their family culture. I think this is important in any culture. My father grew up in an environment where his father was an alcoholic, there was a lot of violence, and he made a decision to build a different family culture. And I praise God for, for that change. Um, but people need help to do that, and the community needs help. Um, another area is training people to use words well. Um, there's a great little book called, by Derek Prince called Blessing or Curse You Choose. And if you come out of an Islamic background, in many cultures, cursing is part of the culture. 
in different ways. I mean, not just Islam as well, just contemporary secular culture in, the, in America. People do a lot of cursing, not just swearing, but just saying negative things about themselves and about others. And training people to speak blessing, to speak life, uh, is a very important part of discipleship. I mentioned the, the example of the parents who call their children Satan, but um, just training a church to speak well of their elders. We, we have appointed leaders, uh, so there's a committee of people that meet once a month to consider the uh, affairs of the church and took a long time to find good people, but no sooner had we appointed them than other people of the church began to tear them down and say, why did you appoint them? Why didn't you appoint me? And they find fault in them. And there's a culture of destructive talk that arises in the church. And, and people are quite scared to be appointed as leaders. Their competitiveness means they want to be, but once they are, then people start pulling them down. Um, so, you, you know, you have to actually go after the root of that, the competitiveness, the pride, the issues with identity that people would be getting pleasure in, in the failures of others. And it's been, I have a lot of conversations with the Iranians to try and understand their culture better and to understand the issues. They explained to me that in Iranian culture, it's quite normal to gain pleasure at someone else's failure. So if you're walking along the street and you see someone trip and maybe the thing they're carrying is smashed on the ground and they suffer, it makes you feel happy, they said. And I said, why is that? I mean, I'm just astounded hearing this. I can't understand it. So they say, why is that? Well, it didn't happen to you. <laughs> and if someone else does badly in an exam, you think, oh, great. That wasn't me, you know? And so you, you, you've got a culture of people taking pleasure out of other people's failures because they feel superior by that person's failure. Now, if you've grown up in a very different culture, this is even hard to comprehend. Like, this is not how my parents taught me to relate to my brother or my sister or other people. But it's deeply embedded. And you can't have a healthy church if people are like that. You know, this will just pull the church to pieces. And that means you have to name these issues and talk about them to talk about them with the group. Is this true? This is how you relate. They smile at me and say, yes. I said, is that healthy? They said, no, we don't think it's a good idea. So what can we do to be different? What does Jesus say about that? Let's look at what Jesus says. He says, bless, bless your enemies. Pray for those who curse you. Rejoice. Weep with those who weep. You know, rejoice with those who rejoice. That's a very sympathetic heart, a different way. So those sorts of things that you know, you, you just might, you just kind of get them with your mother's milk if you've grown up in a Christian background. They actually need to be taught and explained. People need to fall in love with Jesus and, you know, internalize these values. So what you're doing is you're not rejecting culture, but you're transforming it. You're not saying Australian culture is better. You should all be like Americans or like Australians. I mean, heaven help us. That's totally wrong. You know, that's completely wrong. We've got lots of problems in Australian culture. Um, lots of terrible things, and I have to explain that to them too, because they've come to Australia because they didn't like living under Islam. They've become Christians. They recognize that there's order and safety in the society. They know that it's because it's not Islamic. But then they can easily just end up copying their neighbors, and they end up in a, in a different kind of problem, a different kind of hell, which is the Australian secular hell, if you know what I mean, the, the damaged life that people lead, uh, issues with alcohol or other kinds of broken relationships. So they need to be discerning about that. You need to teach, uh, you need to train the, the, the people that you're working with um, to, to work well with other churches, with other communities of faith. Uh, this is a huge problem with Iranian churches. If you've got a city with two Iranian churches, they'll be, in con they'll be, they'll be jealous of each other, they'll be critical of each other. Very hard to get them to work together. And um, I don't mean to stereotype, but the Iranians have told me this and I've seen it as well. So from the very beginning, when I was working with the Iranians, I trained these young men and young women to reach out to the other churches in Melbourne and to have wonderful, excellent, strong relationships together. So we celebrate Christmas together. We celebrate Easter together. We have an annual camp. We have maybe 80 people on a Saturday of our 120 members. But when we had the camp, we had 250 people because all the churches came together at that time. And they know that we honor them and we honor their leaders and we honor their ministry and they honor us. And we have discipled um, the team of us that are working across these churches around Melbourne, have discipled the believers to have this as part of their DNA from the ground up. And we've taught them that if they want to be blessed in the Lord, they need to have a love for the whole body of Christ. And competitive attitudes and behavior between different groups is very destructive, not only of their unity as a whole, but also their fruitfulness in their own lives. 
So we build that in de deliberately. And whenever the, you know, those, those, those leaders of the different churches manifest that kind of behavior and they work together, I'm always very quick to try say, praise God for what you're doing. This is such a beautiful witness uh, to, to, to people that are coming to Christ. And it's so good for you as well. God will bless you in that. So that's, a, that's an example of, of, of teaching Christian values, of building them in. Um, another thing is you teach into pastoral needs, pastoral issues. When I came into this work, I had a background of having studied Islam quite deeply. So I, I had in my mind a roadmap of the characteristic soul, uh, spirit damage that Islam inflicts on people. And I've taught very systematically into those areas. So we teach very specifically about telling the truth. And, and, and look at how that works in practice, because that can be very hard if you have a culture which says you do tell all these white lies in order to uh, make people happy in relationships. Muhammad said that one of the conditions under which you can lie is in order to smooth out relationships between people. So if two people are fighting, a third person might say to one of them, oh, that other guy never really said that, even though they know they did. It's permissible to lie if the outcome is a healed relationship. And you have to explain to people that healed relationships are not worth that price. That's not a good way to think about how harmony and peace works in Christ. And that's actually quite deep because it can feel really logical. You know, the man has cheated on his wife, the wife found out, the friend says, oh no, he never cheated, and then you'll be happy in your marriage together. You need to kind of train people that is not a good kind of happiness based on a lie. You know, that, that's not the way that's not the way the kingdom of Christ works. So we have deliberately and intentionally taught into, into that topic um, and a whole number of other topics as well. So for example, being servant-hearted, uh, learning how to wash each other's feet and cultivating a servant heart. Um, in relation to that, we've been, um, one of the things that are really important is being very slow and deliberate in appointing leaders. Don't appoint leaders too quickly. And uh, there's a few reasons. One is you might find someone else is much better later. It sounds pretty pragmatic, but you can be too quick to appoint a leader. And then you're stuck with someone. It's very hard to, to disappoint them, you know, to sack them. Uh, you, I invited you as a leader, but you're no good, so I'm sacking you. Not a good look. Who else would want to be a leader now, you know? <laughs> I've just sacked the leader. Who wants to have a turn? Um, the other thing is I've always taught from the very beginning that if you want to preach, if you want to be awesome, if you want to lead, you want to lead worship, all these things, I want to know if you can wash the dishes. Amen. You know, can you, can, you, can you sweep the floor? And I just explain that to everyone. You know, there's no, there's no kind of pastoral ministry that's spectacular or whatever, you know, whatever you think is the peak uh, of Christian service. Nothing happens without knowing how to, how to serve in a very practical way. And when I'm looking for the leaders that might be the great, you know, connect group, the, the small group leaders or the preachers or the people running the program, I'm looking, I'm saying, who's cleaning up after the service? Who's washing the dishes? Who's, who's serving other people? Who has a heart to serve? And we explain that, we teach what Jesus said about that, how he said, you have to, you have to wash, you have to let me wash your feet or you have no part of me. So we teach that very consistently. And we were very, very slow to appoint that committee. It took us three years to find the leaders for that group. And we needed to go slow. They have been subjected to criticism from others who felt that they were more suitable for the task. And we, it was good that we were slow because we chose people who were as resilient as we could find, who would be able to talk about these experiences and not be put off by them. Another um, thing that's really, really been important for me is just coming alongside leaders. So uh, after about a year and a half, we appointed uh, two uh, young men to be trained as leaders. And uh, the process was to come alongside them. Actually, one of those young men, as it turned out, he, he, had, he had cancer and he passed away. So there's one that continued on. But I didn't say at first, oh, you're going to be the pastor. What I said was, would you like to be trained as an intern um, leader for three months? And I'll meet with you for three months. And then at the end of the three months, I said, how do you think that's going? And he said, oh, it's good, I think. And I've been meeting with him and his wife. I said, I'd like to give you another trial period. We'll make it a year. So we had another trial period for a year. And then after that, I said, well, let's give it another period. We'll make it like two years. <laughs> and then I said, well, um, why don't you apply to the Anglican Church to become an ordinand, to be trained for ordination? 
and they will interview you, and then there'll be another three years. And every way you'll be supported. You'll be standing alongside you. The, the Anglican Church will support you, and you'll have opportunities to grow. And one of the advantages of that is that as that process was happening, the congregation was able to accept this leadership because they saw they'd been tested and there'd been a process involved and it wasn't just dumped on them quickly and they were able to see the qualities of the person. And the other thing that's been part of that process is with that couple, every week um, on a Tuesday, I spend two or three hours with them just one-on-one -on -one. and they have a huge number of questions every week and we talk through them in great detail. Um, for example, he might say, well, look, someone came up to me on Sunday and said, uh, I'm paying your salary, you know, through the, through the giving, so you should do what I want. And he said, what do I do about that? Oh, let's talk about that. So we talk about that. We talk about the change that's needed in the congregation, what it means to be in pastoral ministry, what it means to be vulnerable to your congregation who are supporting you in ministry. How do you deal with that? Another time, you know, she might come and say, look, when people are upset with my husband, they talk to me, and I just can't bear it, being the kind of lightning rod of everyone else's complaints. She said, does that happen in ministry, that people complain to the wife of the pastor instead of speaking to the pastor? I said, yes, I think it has been known to happen before. <laughs> well, I know that problem myself, I said, and here's some strategies for dealing with it. Um, or someone comes to them and complains about somebody else, what do you do with that? I said, well, what did Jesus say about that when someone has a complaint? You know, how do you, how do you, when do you refer things on? When do you deal with them? So actually, to actually walk through those details, the practical circumstances, talk them through, uh, trial it, come back and report. This is how Jesus trained his disciples. He'd send them out, they'd come back, they'd debrief, he'd send them out, they'd come back. And it's very time consuming to raise a healthy leader. But it's worth it because it's much better than raising people who crash and are unable to cope when they're really coming under attack. So a very slow and deliberate process of coming alongside. My goal with this congregation is that within a couple of years, after seven years of coming alongside, they will be a self-sustaining church within the Anglican system. The fact that it's Anglican is not relevant. It could be Baptist, whatever, it doesn't matter. But there's been a, a process of very intensive walking with them, helping them grow, discipling them, talking through issues, understanding which issues are, 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 are specific to their context, which ones are universal in ministry, passing on wisdom. And remember, you're working with people who have no Christian background, who, who even the most basic things about relationships are not clear to them. And, and they need to be taught everything, it, all sorts of different things. I mean, you learn a great deal yourself as well. Um, and part of it is imparting resilience. Being in ministry is very painful at times, and often the worst pains come from the people you, you care for. I mean, they don't understand often what they're doing, but it can be very difficult, and um, that's hard. And so preparing someone to be resilient in ministry, to love people even when they're being really nasty or they're very broken, uh, that's very important. Very important characteristic for a pastor is not to take offense, not to become bitter, um, and to be able to care for your family as well. So part of the training is your family is more important than your church as a pastor. Your first priority is to care for your wife and your children. So if you have people knocking on your door all hours of the day and night or calling you up at one o'clock in the morning to come and do a deliverance session or whatever it is that they're doing to you, you know, you, you actually need to be able to say, no, I have boundaries. So one of the early things that we talked about was switching the phone off on a particular day. Oh, people will be offended because they expect me to be available. It's our culture. I said, we are going to change the culture of the church in this respect. And we're going to change the culture so they recognize that you have a personal life and that your work is hard and you need to care for your family and that that's okay that you can't just be totally personally available to everyone all the time. And you might say, well, it's Iranian culture. Yes, it is, but I, I want, we want pastors who don't burn out. We want leaders who can last the distance and also model healthy boundaries with their own people. Otherwise, you can get just a lot of dysfunction and damage. So a very intentional long-term process coming alongside. I think if pastors across the US came alongside leaders of, of congregations that have come from a Muslim background and they invested in them and walked with them over periods of years, it would be one of the most fruitful and enjoyable 
and rewarding things that you could possibly do. And if your congregation can release you to come alongside a leader and to spend five years discipling them, walking with them, helping them, it would be such a blessing. I've been actually surprised to hear from my friends who work in the Iranian diaspora, the, the Christians all over the world, that it's really unusual for Iranian churches to have someone coming alongside and helping them. And as a result, you get pastors who are just run off their feet. They're sending emails to people at two o'clock in the morning and thinking it's virtuous, uh, showing their congregation that they're hardworking, their families come under pressure, and there's lots and lots of problems. It could be so easily averted if they were just cared for, if someone was coming alongside them and showing them how they function, showing them how a Christian marriage functions, showing them how, um, how, how leadership works. As I said, we're trialing a, a parenting course. It's a huge need for Muslim background believers is parenting. And so what we've done is uh, someone is gifted in this area and we brought them in and said, you train the, the, the trainee pastor and his wife first. Let's get the leaders across this so they understand these issues and then we'll work out how to pass that on. So there's this process of passing on through reputable people uh, to others. And you know, one of the joys of this, this ministry is the, the people that you're raising up, they just, they just become like your own children. They're very, very dear to you. And Paul writes about this to the, the people that he'd raised up, how dear they were to him because he'd invested so much in them over, over the years. Um, another very important issue is prayer ministry. Um, what we've found amongst the Iranian believers is they have a lot of damage. I mean, there's damage in every society, but there seems to be a high level amongst Muslim background believers. Um, what do I mean by damage? Well, a lot of family trauma, uh, broken marriage relationships, um, um, shockingly high levels of incest, of uh, abuse of women by men in different ways. Uh, many have been tortured by the regime or abused by the regime, so they've got trauma from that background as well. Lots and lots of abandonment and rejection issues in people's lives. Um, there are generational patterns that are very destructive. I remember one young man, his surname was Mujahedzadeh, which means son of a jihadi. And I thought, that's probably not the greatest surname <laughs> because it's meant to, to indicate that we are a jihadi family. This is our generation. We fight for Allah. And in a way, that name symbolizes some of the issues that can happen, patterns of financial failure, of verbal abuse, of, of, of divorce. Um, just some examples. Um, as a couple, they were having troubles in their family. The wife had uh, been a witness to a sister who was sexually abused by a brother. And she herself had not been abused, but this caused very grief, deep grief to her. And as a result, she was angry with men. And as a result, she was angry with her husband <laughs> and was bitter to him. And he would be quite shocked sometimes because he couldn't understand why she was so angry. And so we prayed through that. Now, you need to have tools for prayer ministry to help someone with an issue like that. There's an issue of trauma that needs to be healed. There's issues of forgiveness. So you need a toolkit to help people be healed. Otherwise, they'll just kind of reach that point and they'll just keep hitting against that and their marriage will get stuck. Another example, there was a young woman. Um, she had some psychiatric issues. She was so worried at one point that she called the police in because she was worried she would harm her baby girl. And um, very, very sad, she was depressed. Her baby was just running riot in the house, a uh, little toddler, and I went in to pray. And as we, as we were praying and she, um, just sharing, um, what came out is that she'd been badly abused as a child and sexually abused. And she had internalized the script that it was her fault and that women were uh, kind of shameful and vulnerable and, um, and that it was their fault and it was something disgraceful about being a woman. So when she had a daughter, it was very disturbing to her. And she rejected her child and she was not loving her little daughter because she in a sense hated herself in the daughter. She hated bringing another person like herself into the world. So you've got abuse, you've got trauma, you've got self-hatred, you've got scripts running away. And um, we had a wonderful evening just talking through that. She shared the history. Her husband was a very gentle man and he loves her a lot and he sat through that. And we took her through healing of the trauma, forgiving her abuser, that was not easy. And just talking about what does forgiveness actually mean in that context, meaning doesn't, you're not excusing it or saying that it's acceptable. 
but what does it mean to let that go of that? Forgiving herself, um, uh, affirming her identity in Christ, that she's beloved, that the Lord loves her, God has made her beautiful and actually perfect for who he wants her to be. Um, and then, uh, so this is quite an intensive time of ministry. And after that, her relationship with her daughter was completely changed. And this woman who I'd never really seen wear makeup or making herself look beautiful, she turned up at church looking really beautiful because it was like for the first time she was able to be that person, to be a beautiful woman, instead of seeing herself through the, the frame or the grid of the abuse that she'd experienced. Now, she still struggles, uh, and, uh, but there was a very significant shift that happened, and that little girl began to be loved by her mother, and the family experienced significant healing. So there's a lot of that that's needed of, of deliberate, intentional prayer ministry. And if you're working with a community of people and discipling a community of Muslim background believers, you need some kind of toolkit for these ministry, this kind of ministry. There are lots of options available. Um, my wife is just amazing in this area of prayer ministry, and, and she's looked at lots of different ones. And one that we found particularly helpful is an approach called Restoring the Foundations. It was established by a couple, a U.S. couple called Betsy and Chester Kilstra. Um, and that, that approach uh, really breaks down um, bondage into four areas. One is uh, healing of the wounds, soul spirit wounds, healing of trauma. A very, very important area when you're discipling people from a Muslim background. And basically the essence of healing of trauma is to ask the Lord Jesus to heal people. That's really what's needed. It's like a wound that's never healed in the heart, and it stays there, and it continues to cause problems. Another area is ungodly beliefs, beliefs you have about yourself, the world, that are not true. Uh, for example, um, I can't trust men, or um, I am a shame, there's something wrong with me, or I have to prove that I'm somebody, you know. These sorts of beliefs that people fashion around their experiences in order to cope with them, Satan is very skilled at imp imparting ungodly beliefs into people's lives. And I, I think I could tell you that almost every person has some ungodly beliefs about themselves and their world. And part of coming to Christ and being an effective Christian is naming those and actually listening to God, listening to the Word of God, have the Spirit speak into that area to set you free from those ungodly beliefs. They often partner with the abuse, like the example I said, the girl was abused as a, as a child and she adopted the ungodly belief that it was her fault and that caused a lot of problems. That belief caused a lot of problems. It's a consequence of the abuse. So there's the trauma to be healed, but also the belief. Another area is actually the demonic, casting out demons is needed. But it's very hard to set someone free sometimes from demonic oppression. I never use the word possession, that's not biblical. But it's very, it can be challenging to set someone free when the wounds are not healed and the ungodly beliefs are rampant. You need to deal with all those things. And then there's also generational things that are important. Um, one of the interesting things about working with Muslim background believers is they don't have all these um, kind of blockedness that sometimes Western Christians have in dealing with spiritual warfare issues. They're very willing to engage with the spiritual realm and to deal with it. And that enables them to find healing sometimes quite quickly if they're open to being helped. Um, so part of the toolkit of discipling health in a congregation is helping people find freedom by having some resources to work through those different issues in their lives. Very, very important and helpful um, to, to have that available to, your, to yourself or in your team. Or if you're, if you're an evangelist and you're gathering a group of Muslim background believers or you're working with a group of five people or whatever, get some equipping in this area. Find someone who can come alongside you, have some skills to learn how to pray for people, how to help them be healed. You know, we, we are healed in Christ. The, 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 the wounds of Christ are our healing, but we need to know how to apply that, how to actually um, implement that in our lives. Um, I'm going to just stop there. We've got seven minutes and throw it open for, for questions. I, I just want to say I, I've, I've felt incredibly privileged to be on this journey with this community and the God had been preparing me in many ways throughout my life for it. And uh, it's, a, it's a great joy and we do love the, I do love the church and the, I hope they are a healthy church. They're not perfect but they're growing in health. 
and um, it's, a, it's a beautiful and wonderful joy to see that health flowing through the body, to see people being healed in the midst of a community that's committed to advancing and to becoming what Christ would have them be. Yes, a question. Um, it says in Galatians 4.19, something like that, my little children with whom I am again in childbirth until Christ be formed in you. Uh, I have never actually given birth to a child. I have watched my wife. It's a very painful experience. And sometimes it's a multi-stage process. When you have someone come to Christ, do you take, take them to that 20-point prayer from at the very beginning, or do you have them pray what's normally called a sinner's prayer, and then a, another later session? Well, this is what we do. I don't know that it's perfect. It's just what, we've, what we do. There's, a, there's an evangelistic course called Christianity Explained. I think it was been developed by someone in Queensland. And it's very, it's, it involves reading through Mark's gospel, which is great. And we've trained up the team to do that. So sort of six sessions. So if someone says, I want to become a Christian, we say, we'll do that. And they, a, a, a couple of people lead a group of five or six. And that involves at some point a prayer of commitment to Christ. It's a simple prayer. And then we say to them, you need to come to church for a while. You know, we won't baptize you until you, and we, we have a post we have a, another course that continues on, so there's teaching about identity in Christ. Um, so that's, that's a process, it might be six months or a year. And then um, if they're ready to be baptized, then we meet with them and we go through the more detailed sinner's prayer again, and also through the prayer renouncing Islam at that point and just teach through that. So we do that before baptism. And um, so that's, we don't just throw that at them at the first. We start with, the Christianity Explained starts with Jesus, the Son of God. <laughs> it's quite confronting for people from a Muslim background. Right, you want to learn about Christianity? The first lesson is Jesus is the Son of God. <laughs> but um, there's a really fabulous Bible study you can do with the first few chapters of Mark's Gospel that provides a really good springboard for that. Jesus is Lord over nature. He's Lord over sin. He's Lord over sickness. He's Lord over people. He's Lord of the Sabbath. And you say, well, who is Lord of all these things? You know. And, and people say, well, God. Well, I said, the, the, Mark is explaining that Jesus is Lord. So, so that's, and then we talk about the cross and, you know, and so on. So there's a process. It's not, you don't do it all up front. The other thing I want to say is, this is really important and a bit hard to explain, is in my mind, I have this map of the issues that people are coming out of, from gossip through to sexual abuse through to, you know, whatever. And that map is, that informs the preaching. So you preach through those areas. And I have a map of what healing looks like. There's dealing with ungodly beliefs, there's dealing with soul spirit wounds, there's healing of generational issues, there's dealing with demonic issues. And so I teach through that as well. So you, you, build, a, um, you build a spiritual worldview in people's hearts and minds. So I hope that in Emmanuel, people know what an ungodly belief is and they can identify it and they know how to overcome it and to help someone else overcome it. So the tools that you're using, those resources, you actually build into the discipleship at every level. You're just working it through in lots of different ways. So it's not just, here's this five minute package you apply. It's a whole stream of discipleship that builds health and builds kind of good foundations on Jesus Christ uh, and, and puts tools in people's hands. Like every time, if someone comes to you with real brokenness, they've had some trauma or sickness or whatever, and you're ministering with them, you're, you're teaching them. So the example of that woman who'd experienced abuse and she was healed, you know, as we go through, I'm not just praying, you know, lifting trauma off her, I'm explaining why we're doing it and how we're doing it, and so they know what to do, and then when they're with someone else, they can pray for someone else in the same way. So yeah, everything, this is just built in in every single level in all the discipleship. I must admit, you know, we'd been doing this before uh, with the English-speaking congregation, and then to do it with the Iranians, I, I hadn't realized how perhaps unusual it is to have firstly such a, a detailed map of the problems and then a, a pathway and then to build it all together into a discipleship track. There are some very uh, characteristic issues that arise in the lives of Muslim background believers. I, I spoke about some of them last night. That is, they're really derivative from uh, the problems in Muhammad in his, in his life and his witness. 
So his, his spiritual and pastoral issues get replicated like a virus throughout Islamic communities. And when people come to Christ, they bring a lot of those problems into the church. Um, I think I might have mentioned last night about a man I know who lives in Canada. He's a Christian. He won't have anything to do with other Christians uh, because he's a former Muslim, because he doesn't trust them. He's disappointed in them. Uh, they don't meet up to his standards. And he's very isolated because of that. Um, some of the issues that you'll find in people coming from an Islamic background are jealousy of others. Uh, that comes out of competitiveness. Remember, Islam promises success, and Muhammad was very obsessed with superiority. So if people have that obsession with being, superiority, uh, with being superior and better than others, uh, jealousy will come up. How does that work? Whenever we appoint anyone to leadership in the church, almost inevitably there's someone else that says, why didn't you appoint me? What was so special about him? And then they'll give you, or her, and then they'll list you all the flaws of that person that you've just appointed to leadership. And uh, this is just normal. So every time we appoint someone to leadership of one kind or another, we have to prepare them for this experience of, re of potential rejection by the people they're ministering to, to, who feel that they would be better suited to do their job. So that's an example. That's, uh, uh, you know, that can happen in any church but it's quite intense with this group of people. Another issue is gossip. People will smile in your faces and they'll say terrible things when your back is turned. Um, there is a verse in the Quran, that, uh, the number of verses that say that Muslims shouldn't be friends with non-Muslims, but there's one particular verse which it says uh, the same thing, but it says, except to guard yourself against them. And that's interpreted by commentators to mean that Muslims shouldn't make friends with non-Muslims unless they're vulnerable, the Muslims are vulnerable and they need protection so then they can pretend to be friends in order to be safe. And one of the commentators says, uh, wrote in, about this verse and said, we smile in the faces of some people while our hearts are comforted by hatred. It's kind of shocking to think about it. And um, this, this sort of attitude that it's permissible to put on a good face with people, but as soon as they go to, to tear them apart when you're speaking to someone else, this, I've seen this again and again, amongst Muslim background believers. It's something that needs to be addressed and it's a very serious problem for the health of the church. It's a cultural value. I'm not saying it's, they're relating just out of Islam, but over centuries, Islam has conditioned the culture. And so it's become acceptable to relate in that way. Competitiveness is an issue. Taking offense very easily. Careless and destructive words uh, is a very big issue. People saying things that are very hurtful without counting the cost and not being able to bless others or build others up. Telling lies, another issue too. So what do we do in order to address all the damage, the breakage that's caused by Islam, the inheritance of Islam? Not always just directly by Islam, sometimes by the culture that's been shaped by Islam over more than a thousand years. Um, and I must say, having said this, my experience with this particular group of believers is that if I sit down with them and look them in the eye and I said, you know, your lives were pretty broken before, they'll all say, yes, they were. They know that. And that's why they've come to Christ. That's why they left Iran, because it wasn't working for them. And uh, so that's a good thing. That's a, that's a plus, that people are aware they need help. Um, although sometimes pride interferes with them in, in acknowledging that. One thing that we've paid a lot of attention to in discipling people is to have the, the prayer of commitment done very thoroughly, to have a very thorough prayer of commitment. There's a whole teaching I sometimes do on prayers of commitment. This is the, you know, giving your life to Jesus prayer. I wonder what model of the prayer of commitment do you work with? There are a number of different options available. In the Alpha course, the model, and I've, I've used Alpha for many years, led many people to faith through Alpha, but the prayer they propose is to say, sorry, thank you, and please. Sorry, God, I've been a sinner. Thank you that Jesus died for me. Uh, you know, please forgive me uh, for my sins. Thank you that Jesus died for me. Please send the Holy Spirit upon me. So that's the essence of the prayer, very, very simple. Um, but the problem, there are lots of problems with a prayer like that. It's missing certain things. One of the things that that particular prayer is missing is any reference to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So someone who becomes a Christian by that route, using that prayer, may not, never have heard that they need to submit to Christ as Lord of their life. The prayer doesn't actually speak about turning away from your old way of life. It's just implied. There are things missing in that prayer. 
And uh, what we've learned actually over the years in leading many people to Christ and discipling people is that it's really helpful at times to slow down the process of someone beginning to make a commitment to follow Jesus. And the reason why you slow it down is to make sure you explain the cost and count the cost and make clear what they're doing in making this decision and the implications for them. What you don't want to do is preach the gospel, they give their lives to Jesus, they come to church the next Sunday and you, and you start telling them about, you know, their life now belongs to Jesus. Oh no, he just forgave my sins. I didn't, I didn't buy into that Jesus is Lord thing. And you can create a lot of difficulties in a church community if, they're inadequate, if their entrance is inadequate, if they're not properly discipled at the point of entry. And it's the best time to explain it because they're hungry and they're seeking God and they're willing to hear the truth. But if you don't give it to them, they can be trapped in lots of difficulties. So for that reason, I, I put in, um, in the Liberty to the Captives book on page 107, a prayer of commitment to follow Jesus. And we, we've translated this into Arabic or Farsi, whatever the language. So this is the prayer. We, one of the prayers we take people through before, they be, be, before they're baptized. Another is the prayer renouncing Islam. Uh, but this is this prayer. And I'll just step you through this prayer. It's not just a three point prayer. It takes more than a page. <laughs> it's a 20 point prayer. And I just want to go through some of those points in the prayer of commitment so that um, you can understand why those things are there and why it's helpful to work through that. And when you lead someone through this prayer to teach it well as, as well so they understand what they're doing. So firstly, we confess truth. Uh, we confess the truth. We, I believe in one God, the Creator, Almighty Father. So there's a statement of faith in God. Um, I renounce all other so-called gods, all other claims on my life. It's, it's actually not enough to confess, that you, you, the, the, to, to confess your sins to Jesus and receive forgiveness of sins if you still believe in other gods, if you still have other lords over your life. Um, that's not enough. And so we put that in as well. There's no other God but God. Um, I acknowledge that I've sinned against God and against other people. So not just sin against God or just not just sin against others but both and that this is disobedience and rebellion against God. There's an acknowledgement that I can't rescue myself from my sins. I'm not my own God. I need help. I, but then there's a statement of faith. Um, I believe in Christ, the risen Son of God. He died on the cross in my place. He took upon himself the judgment for my sins. He was raised from the dead for me. And then there's a turning away from my sins. So not just please forgive me, Lord, for sinning, but I choose to turn away from sin. There's a difference. You can ask for forgiveness, but have no intention of turning away from your sin. But repentance means turning away. And so you need to build that into someone's commitment decision as well. And asking for the gift of forgiveness, one on the cross, a reception of that gift, I received this gift of forgiveness. And then um, God as Father is very important to, for people coming out of Islam that they're making a decision that they're accepting God as their heavenly father and a desire to become his uh, child or become, become belong to him. Uh, a request for the gift of eternal life. And this next one is very important and this is often missing in, in, in believers' prayers in evangelism. I hand over the rights to my life to Christ and I invite him to rule as Lord of my life from this day forward. Jesus was absolutely clear about this. You know, if you want to be my disciple, you must die to self daily and follow me. You have to turn away from everything. And you have to hand over the key of your life to the Lord Jesus. You can't be saying, Lord, you just add a bit of value in my life, deal with my sin, I'll be okay for my future, but I'm going to be in control of my life. You know, you have to turn away from the I was always on my mind type of mentality, which is so rampant in our culture as well. One of the challenges in Western churches is that people want to follow Jesus, but they own the rights to their lives. Jesus is like an extra value adding to their lives. But to disciple someone well, to enter into the Christian faith well, they need to hand over the keys to the Lord Jesus and invite him to, 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 rule, over Jesus, to rule over their life as Lord. And let me tell you, if a person has, is spiritually conflicted, they will find this prayer difficult to pray because to declare the Lordship of Christ over your life kind of flushes out issues where there might be rebellion going on in their heart and in their life. This is important to renouncing all other spiritual allegiances, which would include the occult, witchcraft, 
I specifically renounce the Shahada and all its claims upon me. So then we have a prayer for that as well. That's in here too. Actually, there's two other prayers. There's a prayer renouncing superiority and a prayer renouncing lying too, in case that's a particular issue for people. Um, I reject Satan and all evil. You're not just turning to God, you're turning away from Satan. You remember Paul's, I spoke about this last night, Paul's calling was to call people out of the kingdom of Satan into the kingdom of the beloved son. So when people um, come to Christ, they make a transfer. Um, before uh, we baptize people, I always give a message about football. This is soccer. You know, if you're, if you're playing for one football team, and then you transfer to the other team, so you're kicking in a different direction, you, there's two steps to that process. One is renouncing your contract with the first team, and the second is entering into a new contract with the second team. And you have to do both. The worst thing is to be contracted to both teams at the same time, because then you'll have to kick the ball in both directions, and you, well, you might well be killed by the teams if you do that. It's not a good place to be. So if someone's saying yes to Christ, they're saying no to other things. And that needs to be built into their prayer of commitment. I reject Satan and all evil. I, 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 sorry, I, I renounce all other spiritual allegiances. I renounce the Shahada and all its claims on me. So you're saying, I renounce my membership in this team and I'm coming into Christ's team. I'm only going to be kicking the ball in one direction. I only want to score goals in that direction and not in the other direction. Rejecting Satan and all evil. I break all ungodly covenants I've made with evil spirits or principles of evil. evil. Um, people often enter, enter into agreements with spirits in different ways. They've sought help from demons. We've seen that so often in people coming to faith in Christ. Uh, if they're Anglos or just people from general secular American culture, maybe they've been deep into the New Age, they've been astral traveling, whatever they've been doing, and they've entered into agreements ba basically with evil spirits. They need to break those agreements that they've made and cancel them and get rid of them. I renounce all ungodly ties to others who've exercised authority over me. Sometimes people have gurus that have influenced their lives or there's been a religious leader in their previous religion. Someone has had power over them that they've surrendered authority to. They need to reject those links, those power relationships that they've established and cut them off. So those aren't still kind of open and, and, and controlling their lives. This is turning away. Also, um, renouncing or breaking any ungodly covenants the ancestors have made on their behalf. Islam is an intergenerational covenant, and if a man is a Muslim, then he's committing that his children will be as well. So, uh, in a sense, if, that, if the child then turns to Christ, they're breaking the agreement that their father made on their behalf uh, to be a Muslim. So they're, they're breaking that covenant, that agreement that was made on their behalf and that has been impacting them. I renounce all psychic or spiritual abilities that don't come from the Lord through Jesus Christ. This is quite important and often overlooked. We had one woman in the Iranian church who had quite strong psychic abilities. She was very gifted. She could sense things about people, see people's auras, see demons if they were around. And she would read their futures through tea leaves or whatever she did, coffee grounds, I don't know what the method was. And people would give her a couple of hundred dollars for this. And she was making quite a lot of money out of it. She's very good at it. And when she became a Christian, on one of our evenings, I gave a sermon about witchcraft. This was after she turned to Christ. And she was still doing these things. And uh, she came to me and said, I realize I, I need to stop doing these things. Will you pray with me? And I did. And actually, in that period, when she was still practicing witchcraft and um, fortune telling and following Christ, her whole household was attacked by demons. They could see them in the room. Uh, a person who was staying in the house was physically attacked. I came into the house and there was furniture all over the place and the man on the floor with his short t shirt torn and everything. And, and I spoke to this woman who's a very committed member of the congregation these days too. And I said, you know, you're, you're kicking the football in both directions. On, on Sunday or on Saturday, you're with, you're with Jesus. And then during the week, you're inviting the demons to provide guidance. And no wonder war has broken out on your house. You're, you're making some people very angry. You know, some spirits are getting pretty annoyed at you. And it's time to be clear about what you're involved in. And I prayed with her really basically to shut down those psychic gifts. I said, you don't want those sorts of gifts that you've developed and maybe have been enhanced in you by the demonic realm. You need to just renounce that. So she prayed, I renounce this ability to tell the future. I renounce the ability to make money. 
by reading people's fortunes. And Lord, please take it away from me. And then to pray, uh, whenever you remove something bad, you always bless. So then to pray, Lord, please you know, give me the gifts you want me to have, the spiritual gifts that are to build up the kingdom of God, that are actually appropriate for a child of the living God. So there are some things that you really need to leave at the door when you come to Christ. There's some habits, there's ways of thinking, there's some talents you've developed, and one of them is this sort of spiritual abilities that are not of God. I would, I would predict that if you have 100 Muslim background people, there'll be 10 or so who have some sort of ability, I'm just a guesstimate, but there'll be people in that group that have spiritual abilities which they've practiced under the old regime. And my question to you is, did they renounce those things when they turned to Christ? And are they still practicing those things? Um, there's also a, a request for the gift of the promised Holy Spirit, the Father's gift, and um, a, a, a prayer to be transformed, to bring glory to God. This is part of the process at the end of the prayer of dedicating yourself to the glory of God. Uh, seeking to be released, uh, to see the fruit of the Spirit released in, in your life so that you can honor God and love others. So that's a commitment to discipleship, to growth. And a declaration before all the spiritual authorities and before heaven and before human witnesses that I consecrate and bind myself to God through Jesus Christ. So I am signing up with the Lord Jesus team and no other team. I'm, I'm totally devoted to this team. And I declare that I'm a citizen of heaven. God is my protector. With the help of the Holy Spirit, I choose to submit to and follow Christ and him alone as the Lord of all my days. So it's a lifelong covenantal commitment to surrender to Christ as Lord and to walk in that way, in that path. So this is the prayer of commitment that we would take someone through, along with the renouncing Islam prayer, as part of their baptism. And if you miss key elements like total consecration, submitting to Christ as Lord, making a break with previous ungodly commitments, if you miss elements of that, you will be ushering someone into the kingdom of God with chains around their life, with baggage that they shouldn't be carrying, and it's not fair to them, and it's not right. And if, you, if, you, if when you gave your, yourself to the Lord Jesus, if you didn't make these commitments, I encourage you to grab the book. They're, they're still, there might be still a few left, and go, go by yourself or, or with a friend and pray that prayer for yourself and just make that deep commitment of your whole life to God in Jesus Christ. So the prayer of commitment, an extremely important resource. Um, another thing that's very important is that when people come to Christ, there's a, a process of cultural transformation that, that begins to happen. And it's a very far-reaching process. A culture includes some good things and some bad things. There's some things that are of God and some things that are not. And what happens when people come out of a Muslim culture is that that Muslim culture over time has been shaped by Islam. And, it's, and, and Islamic values, the, the, the characteristics of Muhammad's personality, if you like, have become embedded in that culture. And so when people turn to Christ, they're actually entering on a process of reforming their culture. So they still have an Iranian culture, it's not Australian culture, but it's a healed or transformed Iranian culture. And that's quite a process and you need to do that with them intentionally to help them make those choices. Mr. Sikh. There needs to be changes in family culture, for example. One of the challenges we see amongst the Iranians is that parenting is a big problem. Um, the children often run wild. Um, they're very ill-disciplined. They'll stay up till very late at night. Um, the boys in particular sort of seem to do whatever they want to do. Uh, and the parents don't know how to put them to bed on time. And the result of that is that they go to school exhausted in the morning, their, their outcomes are bad, their family life is disordered. One couple I spoke to, they were having very severe problems. He said, I never get to talk to my wife because that two-year-old is running right till 10.30 at night. I said, how does she go to sleep? He said, she just keeps going until she's exhausted. And then I'm thinking, well, no wonder you're not talking to your wife. You've got no time left. You come home from work and you're dealing with this kind of rampant child who then sleeps until 10 in the morning and you have to get up at six. And so you know, they need help to rebuild their family culture. You need to, they need help to learn how to, to develop a bedtime routine, how to read a bedtime story, how to help a child have a settled and ordered life. Establishing safe boundaries is part of that here as well. Um, 
part of the culture of, of uh, the Iranians is that people should be constantly available. People will just drop in at any time and they'll expect you to feed them. So you're sitting there with your family and then someone knocks at the door at eight o'clock at night and they expect that you would provide a meal for them at, the, at that very moment. And this happens all the time. And the problem is if you become a pastor, you've got a hundred people that might drop on your door at any time expecting a meal. Now that's not healthy. It's not sustainable. So we have to work with the community to change and challenge that culture. And it's not always easy. I mean, there's some lovely things about that culture. There's generous hospitality and openness and kindness and so on. But at the same time, it can be quite controlling. And people could be burnt out in ministry, just the burden of having to do that. You've got children, you need to get to bed, you need to talk to your husband about something, and suddenly these people who are your own congruence that you're caring for and you have to love, because that's what Christians do, they just love people, and they turn up and you're supposed to feed them at you know, any hour of the day or night. It's not sustainable. So you, you, it, that leads a change of culture in the church, a change of culture to have people be more considerate and to realize that, that it's good to have healthy boundaries. Um, you need to be able to teach these things from the scripture as well. Like this is integrating the understanding of Jesus and the way of Jesus uh, with, um, with, the, with, the, with the word. Another area is, is training people to use their language to bless and not to curse. There's a lot of cursing in Iranian culture. So for example, parents will often call their children Satans. Like the little child's running around wild at eight o'clock at night. So he says, you know, stop doing that, you little Satan. And... Um, <laughs> I have had some wonderful conversations with the congregation and with people there about these very issues. And um, they sort of look at you and they, they know it's not right. Uh, and so part of, part of the discipling is teaching them to choose to bless their children and not curse their children. Do you really want your children to be Satan's? Then why call them that, you know? There's a great book by Derek Prince, Blessing or Cursing, You Choose. Blessings or Curses, You Choose. Uh, and in fact, this is something that all Christians need to know how to do, how to be people of blessing. They, we build up, we don't tear down with our words. Our, our lips are holy. They're meant to be to consecrate people to life, not turn them into death, you know? And so training, when you have a whole culture, there's a lot of verbal abuse and a lot of gossip and a lot of tearing down. That's a deep cultural change. And it's extremely important if the congregation is to survive. Um, and it needs direct and aggressive discipleship. So this is not rejecting Iranian culture. There's some wonderful things about Iranian culture. Their passion, their emotiveness, um, their, their willingness to give all to follow Jesus. These are beautiful things, but there's things that are not right. And working with them, we, we teach into these areas to build a healthy culture. Protecting leaders as well as they find their vocation and their feet with this. Um, another interesting area is um, when you have a church of Muslim background believers in a city and there's another church of Muslim background believers, often those two churches will be in conflict with each other. One will say, my church is better than your church and there'll be competition. So that's very normal with Iranian churches. They don't get on well together. When we have visiting speakers and we send them up to another city and we say to the churches, please work together to welcome this speaker and organize a joint event, they just can't do it because they've got these antipathies. Our church is the better church, you know. So when we were involved in this work with the Iranians, from the very beginning, we trained them to work together with other churches. And we taught them that if you're not in unity with other churches, that damages you. It, it, it limits your blessing in Christ. And so we have Christmas services together and Easter services together. We have about 80 people in the service on a Saturday. At our annual camp last November, we had 250 people because they came from churches all over the city because the leaders have humbly been working together and building each other up. And we've taught them that from the very beginning. You're a Christian now, it's time to work together with your brothers and sisters. So we never criticize or tear down the other congregations. We always build them up. That is those that are willing to come along with us, we work together with, and those that aren't, we don't curse them either. Um, we discourage criticism of other ministries and other congregations. So that's an example of building a, a culture of grace uh, between the churches. That's so important because you need the leaders to buy into that. And if they buy into a culture of grace in terms of their relationship with other believers and their openness to others, that will filter into the whole church. The whole church will be blessed if they see their leaders honoring ministries from other churches. Uh, and that's a really powerful thing. And their prayers are answered because they're walking in love with each other. Um, we also teach into pastoral needs. So 
um, because of my studies of Islam, I had a roadmap in my mind of the various areas that are problematic for people coming out of Islam, like telling lies, competitiveness, taking offense, victim mentality, and so on. And, um, and so you teach into those. And that process is informed by your knowledge of Islam and also the culture. But as you get to know people, you begin to learn where the, the, uh, the bodies are buried, if you like, you know, where are the pain, points of pain. And um, working with the uh, Iranian people, you realize they have lots of trauma, uh, lots of family trauma, rejection, uh, abandonment in family structures. Divorce is very easy in Islam. Um, you can have even temporary wives in Shia Islam, where you marry, a man marries a woman for an hour or two. And um, so there's a lot of instability in family life, uh, a lot of damaged relationship with fathers. Islam teaches that a father has the duty to force their children to be compliant with Islam. And so th this results in abuse. The Quran says that a man can beat his wife. So um, uh, spouse abuse is very common as well. Um, there's a lot of incest in people's personal stories, the shameful family relationships that are very damaging. And so we teach into these, teach into these issues all the time to build health. Where you know there's a problem, you direct your teaching and your you're pastoring into those areas in order to build strength. But you need to know what those issues are. Relationships between men and women are very damaged, so you need to teach godly relationships between men and women. Another thing that's important is be very slow to appoint leaders. Don't, don't promote people too quickly. What did Paul say? You know, don't advance a new Christian into a role of leadership, lest they become inflated in their self-opinion and it's bad for them and bad for the church, so take time. What happens though if everyone in the church is a new Christian? They've all become Christians in the last six months, and you've got 50 people. How are you going to find a mature leader? What are you going to do about that? You need leaders, you can't do it all. I don't even speak Farsi. How can I disciple 50 people and they're all new Christians? So I'll tell you what I did. I looked around and I saw a guy who seemed to be the most, one of the most stable people, very gracious, always supported his wife, always, uh, you know, he related to her really well, was very godly in the way he related to people, and I gave him a job to do. I trained him to, to lead a course, and he did that well. And then I said, would you like to be trained as a leader for three months? I'll meet with you every week for two hours, and at the end of the time, we'll see how you go. Just a trial. And he said, yeah, we'll give that a go. So after three months, I said, I think this is going, how do you, well, how do you feel? He said, yeah, I feel it's good. I was meeting with him and his wife each week. And, um, and then I said, well, let's do it for another year. So we told the congregation, this man is going to be in training for another year and we'll be supporting him. And then after a year, I said, okay, we'll give it another two years. And then after that, I said, well, why don't you apply to the Anglican diocese to become an ordinary, which means that you're in training to be ordained. And that'll be another three years. And you know, as this process is happening, you, um, you're, you're gradually building confidence in the community and his leadership. You give multiple ways that he can exit without being damaged. Because the worst thing you want to do is quickly appoint someone to leadership and then find out six months later that they were not a right person. They were just the person that was kind of flattering you all the time. And so you thought they were great, but they're actually no good. And then you realize there's, there's 10 other people who would have been much better. What are you going to do? You're going to tell the church, I've sacked him. Would anyone else like to be a leader? You too could be sacked. That would be exciting, wouldn't it? <laughs> so it's very difficult. So you, you actually you go very slowly. You, you're slow to appoint leaders. And another thing that we, we've trained uh, the people in and explained many times is if, if you want to preach, if you want to lead worship, you need to be very, very good at washing dishes and cleaning toilets and and just cleaning the floor. And, and you know, I, I, to find out the future pastors and the leaders, I watch the people that have heart to just serve without complaining and do it generously. And you teach that from the Gospels as well, Jesus washing his disciples' feet. You look for this capacity to serve, to understand what that really means, so that people aren't becoming leaders for, to serve their own egos or their own gratification. I once had an assistant um, who actually, he was not in the Iranian community, but um, he was being trained and uh, he, he, I, I gave him a job setting up for communion. And look, when you're trained to be a minister, you, you do these things. But after a while, he said, oh, I'm meant for better things. I, you know, I'm sure I can make a great difference in the church if I had a different role, leading a group or teaching or, you know, this, this is too menial for me. I'm a gifted person and um, I'm called to be a priest and I should be doing other things. <laughs> I was just smiling. I was thinking, 
I'm not sure that you're really ready for the other things because unless you can just do the simple things, then how can you do the bigger things? And anyway, if you want to be a leader of a church, you've got lots of simple things to do all the time. I mean, I'm always emptying the bins and cleaning the toilets or whatever it is. It's like, you know, when everyone else goes home, who's going to do it? It's me. So unless you've got a heart to do the menial things, you can't do the whiz-bang exciting things. Uh, he ended up going very, very badly. He ended up in prison, actually. So th there wasn't a good outcome. <laughs> Um, so we train people how to select leaders, how you recognize leaders, what characteristics to look for, and then you raise them up slowly so that if there's something goes wrong, they can step back without being shamed. But shame is another issue in an Islamic culture. So you protect people. You also impart resilience. Resilience. If you're in pastoral ministry, it can be very painful. You can come under lots of attack from the people that you're caring for and loving. Every pastor knows this. You've, every pastor has had some experience where you've been let down or hurt by the people that you've been caring for. And it can often be really hard for your family. So I, I meet with a couple who are, who are training to lead the church every week. And one week, um, she, she, she speaks up and she says, you know, Mark, when people are upset with my husband, they come and tell me. And she said, does that happen to other pastors? Uh, does it happen to other pastors that people speak to your wife instead of to you? Yeah, oh yeah, that does happen. It happens all the time. I said, I'm six foot seven, and I'm big and I'm a bit intimidating. So if someone's really annoyed with me, they go and tell Debbie, my wife. And um, <laughs> I said, it's, it's not fair because your wife becomes like the garbage can for everyone's issues. And it's very damaging. And so it's, it's good to have someone to talk about these things with, to take time to work through the issues. So building resilience, how to deal with rejection in pastoral ministry. We have talked so much, so many times, I've talked that through with, the, with these people that we're raising up for leaders. People will disappoint you. They will reject you. Let's look at the parable of the seed and the sower. Some of the seed fell on the path and it was eaten up. Some of it didn't bear fruit for one reason or another. Some, however, brought enormous fruit. So when you're in pastoral ministry, you're going to be disappointed by some people, but others will just amaze you and thrill you. And you need to invest in the people that are bearing fruit and not to be broken by the people that aren't. And learning that is part of pastoral ministry. That's part of being a pastor. So you're building resilience in, in, to a leader in a toxic environment because people are coming out of a non-Christian environment, so they've got lots of bad habits. So you need to protect people that are coming up in leadership and walk with them and help them to be safe so they can set a good example for the whole church. Another issue that's really important is the role of prayer ministry because people come with a lot of brokenness, a lot of needs, a lot of hurts. Um, if you're involved in ministering to Muslim background believers and is trying to establish a community of them and leading that community and raising up leadership, you need to have some model of prayer ministry that you're working with to help people find healing. And that's incredibly important. Um, let me just give you an example. I was called out one night to a pastoral situation. A woman was suffering from psychiatric issues. She and her husband had a little daughter who was about two years old or a year and a half, uh, running riot. And the mother was so depressed and worried that she called the police to come and take the child, but she was worried she might kill the child or hurt the child. And so I was asked to come and talk with her. So we talked and, you know, the Lord guided us. And she explained that when she'd been very little, um, she'd been sexually abused. And as a result, she'd formed the view that she was shameful, that it was her fault. And what's more, that women in general were shameful. And when she had a daughter, it was very shocking to her and she was very upset. And she rejected the daughter because her daughter was one of these shameful people like her. And this, this was the, really the essence of her whole issue. And what, I, what we did is, well, I thought there's a few different things happening here. There's the abuse and the trauma from that. Um, there is the lies that have become attached to that, the ungodly beliefs like, I am ashamed, there's something wrong with me. Um, and the rejection of her child. Um, and her husband was a really lovely and gentle man. He stayed through the whole time. And so we prayed through those things. I prayed for healing of the trauma, led her through a prayer of forgiveness about the abuser. I explained that, you know, that is not saying that the person is not going to face judgment with the Lord. They are, but it's a letting go of something rather than holding on to that pain. 
and then led her through affirming her identity in Christ, that she's not ashamed, that she's a beautiful princess in the kingdom of God, that God has made her well, there's nothing wrong with her in terms of God's purpose and plan for her, and then led her through a process of accepting and accepting her daughter and choosing to see her daughter in a different way, not as one of these abused people that she is so devastated to have to bring another girl into the world. And it was really lovely after that um, because I saw her at church, the mother came to church, she hadn't been coming for quite a while. And for the first time that I remembered, she was wearing makeup. She'd actually made herself look beautiful, and she was beautiful. There's always that I'd seen her, she tried to make herself look ugly, you know. That was part of the problem of her, of her pain or her experience. And so I, I had some tools to pray through those issues with her. One of the, we use a model called Restoring the Foundations. My wife's really great in prayer ministry and looked at many different approaches, but this is quite a helpful model. And in that model, there are a number of different areas you help people find healing with. One is trauma, healing of wounds, soul spirit wounds. So people often carry wounds and the wounds are like a, a festering sore, an ulcer in their heart. And unless that's healed, a lot of problems attached to that wound continue to rise up. So we, I, as soon as I heard this story, I knew we needed to pray for healing of the heart. Another area is ungodly beliefs that people buy into. I think everyone in this room has some ungodly belief or other that's arisen in your life for all sorts of reasons. And these ungodly beliefs are implanted in our souls through the work of Satan, through life circumstances. And this particular woman had, had accepted the ungodly belief that there was something fundamentally wrong with her because of the abuse that she'd experienced. And that's not the truth. It's not something from God. And that belief was really damaging her. It was making her depressed. It was making her ill. It was causing her to reject her daughter as well. So I led her through a prayer renouncing that ungodly belief. I renounced the ungodly belief that I am ashamed and that it was my fault. And, um, and then worked with her to uh, help her hear from the Lord and understand what the truth of what God's word says for her. So she had a godly belief instead to build into her life. Another area in that particular model of prayer ministry is to deal with generational issues. So if I have a conversation with someone about an issue like that, I'd be trying to find out what's been the pattern down the family. Is there a persistent pattern? And there often is, you know, of breakdown in relationships or whatever it is. Another area is demonic uh, interference. So at the end of that time, I would have prayed and said, and we also command all demons, you know, of rejection and abandonment and so on and self-hatred to go and not to interfere with her anymore. Another example, uh, there's a young woman who when she was um, a girl had um, become aware that her sister was being sexually interfered with by her older and stronger brother. And she was actually aware on one occasion of that actually happening in the room next door and, was, and her sister's distress. And the effect on this young lady, a beautiful Christian woman, was that she didn't trust men and she was quite angry with men. And the effect of that is that when issues occurred with her husband and they had some sort of friction, this anger would kick in very, very deep. And he was just shocked, like, I don't know what to do with my wife. What's wrong with her? Why is she so aggressive towards me? And, and in order for their relationship to be healed, uh, she, needed, she needed to um, actually go through a process of healing of her own trauma, of forgiveness again, forgiving herself for not being able to help and not being able to intervene, the sense of powerlessness, um, the relationships with relatives. There was a lot of different issues that were affecting her and afflicting her. And praise God, God brought healing in their relationship. So instead of having a, a couple who are broken and always fighting and, and putting a lot of energy into a destructive uh, pattern caused by deep-rooted issues, you've got people who are growing in maturity in Christ and who are able to support each other and are able to be effective for ministry. Multiply that by 100 and you have a church that's becoming healthy, that's growing in Christ, is being healed. The other thing about this process of prayer ministry is that as you minister to people, you teach them. So in praying for the, for the woman who'd been abused as a child, you say, well, now we're going to pray for healing of trauma. Jesus heals our traumas. We don't have to be stuck in that place of pain. He died on the cross for us. He's received that and he can take that from us. So you teach the person the process of healing and then you have a whole church of people who understand what healing looks like, what, what, what being able to progress and overcome your wounds looks like. And you have a community that's not only healthy in themselves, but they can help others. And the other thing you do is you, you, um, 
you teach into these, into these themes through the whole congregation's life. So um, you teach about the healing of, of wounds of the soul as part of your healing. There's lots of examples in the Bible that you can use to engage with that. Um, you teach about how to deal with ungodly beliefs and the resources that you have in the Word of God to deal with that. And in everything that you're doing in your sermons, and your preaching, the Bible studies, your personal one-on-one -on -one discipleship is building health into people. It's actually applying the power of the cross and the message of the gospel and making it practical and making it real and multiplying it in people's lives. And um, so that's been a, just an incredible privilege uh, for that. I have increasingly, as time goes on, focused more and more just on a few leaders. And um, I, I spoke with um, the, the pastor of the congregation that we've been raising up, the lovely young man, and I said, I'm spending hours every week with you, and I have for five years. And I said, the reason why I'm doing that is that you will do this for others, that you will raise up others. And because this is the issue, this is the issue, this is a big issue. In Iran, it's, and in the Iranian diaspora, it's said that there's more than a million Christians, people who've turned from Christ. There were maybe three to 500 when the Iranian revolution happened. Now it's hundreds of thousands and rapidly increasing. It's possible that in the next hundred years, Iran will become a majority Christian country. If that continues at the same rate, it's going to happen. But who's going to disciple all these believers? What happens if you, if you push 50 million broken people into churches? Where are the pastors going to come from? How are they going to survive as communities? What sort of community, what sort of theology will develop? How will that work? Where will the leaders come from? You know, revival can be messy, it can be very difficult, and the problem with having the harvest all coming at once is it can end up rotting on the ground. And that's devastating to even think about, that a, that a plan that God has prepared for generations to call a whole nation to Christ might, be, might suffer because there aren't leaders to help care for the harvest. So I said to this young man and his wife, I said, God is going to call you to raise up others. So everything that I show you, you show others. I can't show it to 20 people. I've got my own English-speaking congregation to care for and the global ministry and I'm traveling. I can't do everything, but I can train you and you can train others and you can train them to train others as well. You build that into the replication, the multiplication of discipleship. It's very time intensive. It's not a quick fix process but you can do it in a way that can continue and ripple down and affect many people's lives and have a huge impact. You know, there are, uh, I didn't realize that many of the things that we were doing were unusual. I just thought this is what you do, this is what I'd learned. Um, but I've found that again and again around the world where Iranian churches have been founded in the West, the pastors often don't have uh, a long-term Christian mentor who's been an established disciple of Christ throughout their life to walk with them. And they have to invent it all themselves. So what happens is the pastor ends up sending emails to people at two o'clock in the night and being proud that he's showing to people that he's working hard. <laughs> and it's not good for his family, you know. And, and so no one has ever told them you need to put your family first. You need to establish strong boundaries. You need to make sure you have a day off. You need to take your vocation. You need to make sure your, your vocation. You need to make sure the church understands that you have responsibilities to your family. No one has taught them that. And as a result, you have high, very high risk ministries and people can uh, end up in a lot of trouble. And the church is seeing a bad example. And that could be prevented if someone had only sat with that pastor and helped them and helped them to grow. And again and again, all over the world in the diaspora, in the West, you've got these communities of believers arising and they desperately need an experienced pastor to just come alongside and help them and walk with them and listen to them and pray with them. They're desperate for that. Um, I, I'm working with our group, but there's several other Iranian congregations in Melbourne, and they have some amazing young leaders, but they are just, they're just so desperate to have someone who could sit alongside them and walk with them. They'd, one of them came to me and said, I'm so jealous of your leader that you're spending time with him, you're supporting him. I am desperate for someone who can do that. And it's actually, it's not rocket science, it's a matter of just sharing your heart, listening, praying, walking with people. And if, if we are in the midst of this explosion of evangelism, um, you heard about it before from George, it's happening all over the world. The most amazing harvest that's happening among Muslims. And my, my greatest concern is that there won't be the leaders to bring the harvest in well, and it'll be very messy. And so I'm extremely passionate about raising up um, a generation of leaders that can, that can pastor well and build health in the church 
and, and build a transformative culture so that people can build a new Iranian culture, a culture that's profoundly transformed by the gospel. This is what has happened down the centuries uh, through the generations. And in many ways, we live off the inheritance of that here in, in America or in Australia, but we need to redo it all uh, in the context of, of, of these Muslim background believers. So that's, um, that's, I'm very passionate about it, and uh, I suppose there's a whole book to be written about this and a manual to encourage pastors to come alongside and help people uh, in these situations. So um, I want to say to you, if you've been working amongst Muslim background believers and it's been hard and it's been disappointing, don't give up hope. There are resources, there is a way forward, and uh, God can use you powerfully to make a change in many people's lives, and it can be many other people in a kind of domino effect that the health that you can pass on to a leader, a significant person, could have an effect in many, many people's lives well beyond, well beyond that particular interaction. Thank you all very much. Thank you.